been in a series called Stay Positive. Today's going to be our last day in that subject, talking about the whole idea of staying positive. And I uh, just want to say how being able to be involved in worship helps me stay positive, especially when we have such an amazing team. Amen. And so it's great to be in the fellowship, be in worship, so God by his spirit can touch and transform. That's not only just my life, but our lives and fill us with his spirit. There are two kinds of people in the world, at least from my perspective. There are two kinds of people in the world, those who let their environment influence their enthusiasm, and those who let their enthusiasm... What's the rest? Talked about that before in different contexts as I talked about the question, are you a thermometer or are you a thermostat? Recognizing that as individuals we ought to be positive and we need to allow the Spirit of God to empower us so our enthusiasm, our, our, our positivity, our faith impacts our culture as opposed to allowing the circumstances around us to influence. Some of you Uh, May have never had the privilege, but several years ago when I came to Tecumseh, there was a lady here whose name was B. McKenzie. And B. McKenzie had a a physical deformity which caused her to have some impairment physically, but she never, ever, ever, at least to me, lost the element of her enthusiasm. She was always smiling and even in the face of physical limitations allowed for God to use her to impact the lives of people. Some of you as well never had the privilege of uh, knowing an individual named Karen Thomas. Karen Thomas, uh, her and her husband John got saved just briefly after or shortly after Sherry and I came to Tecumseh. And uh, Karen was just an individual who just whose enthusiasm was undaunting. She was facing leukemia and uh, dealing with that particular issue, which eventually led to her leaving the planet and entering into heaven at, at the very end, saying, I'm ready! I'm ready! But she would always say to me, Pastor Tom! She just had such an element of enthusiasm. She always stirred me, just like B. McKenzie, even in the face of physical limitations, said, I'm not going to allow that to bring me down. I'm going to allow God's spirit to empower me to make a difference in the world around us. You may or may not know this, but the word enthusiasm really comes from two Greek words. En, meaning in, and theos, meaning God. It really kind of comes from the Greek word enthusiasmo, which really talks about the whole idea of the inspiration or actually is defined as possessed by a god. You may or may not know this, but it actually entered the English language around the 17th century. And for the first 200 years that it was used in English, it was used primarily to refer to beliefs or passions about religion. Recognizing that as we talk about the whole idea, I want to talk about enthusiasm today. Enthusiasm literally means in God or filled with God. And so when we talk about the whole idea of enthusiasm, it isn't necessarily just a result of some aspect of mood. Enthusiasm, at least I'm going to contend today, biblically speaking, is directly related to an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth. And so turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. While you're turning there, I'm going to pray. God, thank you for your presence in this place today. I'm asking in the name of Jesus that you would help me, God, to preach the word. I know your word will not return void, but it will accomplish what you please. It will prosper in the thing learned to send it. And so let me, God, deliver the message in the inspiration and power of the Holy Spirit so that we can be enthusiastic, Lord, not just in an emotional sense, but in a spiritual sense, empowered with your spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul, penning to the church at Corinth, says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord. 
For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Let me read. That's just a powerful couple verses. He says, but thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastic. How many of you know what always means? Always. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Now, if you're familiar with Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, you know that the 56th verse, he tells us that sin carries the sting of death. And then he tells us that law gives the, the sin its ability to bring death. But then he says, thank God. Can I just tell you, if you have nothing else to be thankful for this morning, you should be thankful that God has delivered you from the power of sin through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm praying that you never are a Christian so long that the idea of that truth doesn't bring enthusiasm to your heart. Some people are like, oh yeah, I heard that before. What? Can, can, I, can, I, can I get a witness? Recognizing, can I just tell you that as an individual, in 1979, January 1970, I don't remember the exact date, but in January 1979, I'm on my couch on 1412 Downey Street. Somebody had given me a chick track. I'd been going to a Bible study. I used to smoke dope and then go to the Bible study and they would tell me about Jesus. And so I'm kind of exploring the whole thing. And I'm in, the, I'm in my living room at 1412 Downey Street, January 1979. I flipped the back of the chick track. And I said, well, I guess I'm made to give this a try. Prayed the prayer off the back of a chick track. Jesus, I need to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. Can I just tell you? Boom! Boom! Just like that. Yeah. Boom! I have been changed. I have been transformed. And I will never, ever, 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 ever forget that. It's by the grace of God that I have been redeemed. And I was just like, I just, just, I know they said, well, I think you're just getting a little emotional. <laughs> Hokey smoke, Bullwinkle, how could you not? Anybody here perfect? Can I get any? How many perfect people are in here? Raise your hand. We need to pray for you. Now, if you say, I am perfect because the shed blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me from the power of sin, and my perfection is found in the grace and mercy of God, then okay. But that very thought ought to cause you to go, thank God Jesus came. He delivered me from the power of sin. We worship because God has given us the victory. I, I'm here today. Not just because I'm the pastor to come to the Assembly of God and I've got to be here, although there are days I feel like that. Just like there are days you come because you're like, okay, it's time to go to church. But all of a sudden, all of a sudden, can I get a witness? All of a sudden, I'm gripped by the reality. I'm just, I'm just here to say... I, I'm not sure when, I'm not sure how, I can't totally understand or comprehend it. But one day, the trumpet blast is going to sound. And the twinkling of an eye, in a moment, we will be changed. And I'm just saying, I'm, one of these days, just like a Karen Thomas, I want to be going, I'm ready, I'm ready. And I hear the words. Well done, good and faithful. So I'm just here to tell you, I won't be going, well, cool. <sighs> okay, hang with me. He said, so my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Where does that strength come from? That strength comes from God. 
It comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. It comes through reading the word of God. It comes through prayer. It comes through seeking the face of God. It comes through being in fellowship and connecting with the body of Christ. He said, be strong, immovable. He said, recognize that. And then he crowns the whole thing with these words. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do If you're here, mom, dad, maybe, and you're changing a diaper, how many's ever done that? And all of a sudden, especially if you have a male child and they decide it's time to urinate. Or you're playing around with your kid, and you're like, ha, ah, and all of a sudden they, uh. can I get a witness? No matter what you do. He said, knowing that everything you do, Nothing you do for God is ever worthless, ever useless. God is able to bring his encouragement and strength into our life. Working for the Lord causes mundane tasks to be something that, are, that is in, we can be enthusiastic about, knowing that I'm not just working for, I don't work for this, uh, to come see the assembly of God. I don't work for the assemblies of God. I work for God. So if I'm out, if I do it with all of my heart, recognizing that, that I, no matter what I do, I'm doing it for the Lord because nothing I ever do for the Lord is useless. Think about that. Nothing you do for the Lord is useless. He said, work with all your heart as for the Lord and not for people. There are times that people, you know, as long as everybody else is around, and that's my prayer. I don't want to just be enthusiastic because I'm in front of everybody. I don't want to be enthusiastic and kind of like pop up and down just because I'm the leader. I want to be enthusiastic because Jesus changed my life. Because he's my redeemer, he's my friend. Recognizing that nothing I do, no matter what it is, it's never useless for God. Colossians, Paul penned it this way. He said, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and, what, and that the master you serve is Christ. In other words, if you're mowing the lawn, maybe you're mowing the church lawn, whatever you're doing, I'm not just mowing the lawn, I'm working for the Lord. Recognize that if I'm a stay-at-home parent, I'm not just a stay-at-home parent. In fact, I really kind of despise that whole thing. I'm just, I'm just, I just, I, I don't work, I just stay at home. You've got kids, or you may not even have any kids. We've been empty nesters for quite some time, and can I just tell you, we talk about it every once in a while. My gift is making messes. Sherry's still working. Just saying, no matter what you do, you're working not for an individual, but you're working for the Lord. If you're waiting tables, I'm not just waiting tables, I'm working for the Lord. If I'm a CEO of a company, I'm not just a CEO, I'm working for the Lord. If I'm involved in children's ministry, I'm not just working, helping out parents, I'm working for the Lord. If you're involved with uh, edge youth ministry, whatever it might be, if I'm, well, matter if I'm just greeting, I'm not just greeting, I'm working for the Lord. Everything I do, enthusiasm isn't a product of the environment, it is a position of faith. Can I just say I want my enthusiasm, my faith? Can I get a witness? I want my enthusiasm, I want my faith to be contagious. I want people to go, man, not, not just because that's an image that I want to produce, but because I truly believe that I have been redeemed. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Amen. Been redeemed. That whole element brings me encouragement. Paul, I want to be like Paul, who in the book of Acts chapter 16, he's been beaten, thrown into prison, under guard. And if you talk to Paul, Paul's like, you think me being in prison here is a bad thing? These guys put me in a position where I can witness to Roman guards. I'm a secret agent for the kingdom of God. I'm not here locked away. I'm a witness for the kingdom of God. Whatever I do, 
I do it for the Lord. I want to talk about the entheos of David for a couple of minutes today. Most of you are familiar with King David. He was a young boy who eventually became the king over Israel. And I want to talk about his entheos or in, in th his enthusiasm for the kingdom of God. Where did he get it? I want to talk about how he lost it. We'll do that today. But we'll talk about that next week because the mind can only absorb what the rear end can endure. And we'd be here way too long. I just want to talk about how David had it, because what happened is, David had enthusiasm. He ended up from a, in a position at a time when he lost it. And just like many of you, at one time maybe you were enthusiastic about the things of God, but you lost that enthusiasm. You need to get it back again. And I want to talk about what David did to help keep him enthusiastic, how he had enthusiasm, and recognizing that uh, he, I want to start with Goliath. He, he started... As he went with Goliath, what caused him to be able to have that kind of confidence with Goliath? And so, 1 Samuel chapter 17, I want you to go over there with me if you would. 1 Samuel chapter 17, grit your electronic Bible out. If you have, don't have one, there should be a black one in front of you. You can open it up and uh, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Many of you are familiar with this particular story of how David went out against the giant Goliath, how and why did David have entheos? Why was he enthusiastic as he was facing the giant? The Bible tells us in the 17th chapter, the 41st verse, Goliath walked out toward David and his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, the New Living Translation says, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the, and wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin. But I come to you, can I get a witness? How many of you think? I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you and, will get, and will, I will kill you and cut off your head and then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled there will know that the Lord rescues his people, not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. Where did David get that kind of confidence, that kind of enthusiasm that he could take and face Goliath the giant? It started when David was younger. The Bible tells us, as David responds, tells, lets us know that David is saying to Saul, Hey, I was out watching the, she the, the sheep, and a lion and a bear came out and took the sheep. What did David do? The Bible tells us that instead of running for his life, David runs toward the lion and toward the bear. The Bible tells us, as he explains it to Saul, he said, the Lord who gave me the paw of the lion and the bear will also do the very same thing to this uncircumcised Philistine. David's enthusiasm came from his trust in God. And so I want to talk about, one, tr David trusted God. He walked with God and he was a worshiper. David was out. And he, he trusted God. You can tell that he trusted God because of the way that he did. And I, can I just say to you, I know that there are people in this room who have mega trust issues. The reason you have trust issues is because somebody betrayed your trust. People over time perhaps have beat trust out of you. And sometimes that can happen with our relationship with God. We can say, well, you know, I've seen circumstances, and I just want to say this to you, and so let me just say it to you, and I'm going to probably repeat it a couple of times. Just because God doesn't do everything you want him to, doesn't mean he isn't trustworthy. 
me just say it one more time. Just because God doesn't do everything you want him to doesn't mean that he isn't trustworthy. I have been serving the Lord a long, long time, and many of you perhaps longer than myself. You recognize that if God did everything you wanted him to, there are times you would have been in deep weeds. If you would have had everything you wanted. And can I just say to you, we recognize that just because God doesn't do everything we want, doesn't mean that he doesn't know what he's doing and he can't be trusted. Some of you guys here in this room are parents or have been parents. If you've had, you've been a parent, you maybe are a parent, maybe you're, you have a, a teen or a, a young child, your goal is to help them and, and encourage them to trust you. Because if you've ever been a parent or you are a parent, can I just tell you, I know that there are going to be times that you're going to make decisions or say something to your child that they are not going to understand. They're not going to comprehend. They're not going to know why you're saying either no or yes or whatever it is you're doing because they can't comprehend it. But the goal is, is that they would trust you enough that in the face of that decision, can I get an amen? You can, they can go, you know what, my, my parents, they wouldn't make that decision if it wasn't good for me. God is in control. Proverbs chapter 3, and with a lengthy portion of scripture, so just hang with me. Hang on. My child, never forget the things I have taught you. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years and your life will be satisfying. Write Proverbs down. If you're you're taking notes, write this this, this chapter down and go back to it later. He said, my child, never forget the things I've taught you. Store my commands in your heart. If you do this, you will live many years and your life will be satisfying. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with both God and people, and you will learn, earn a good reputation. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. In other words, I can trust God even when I don't understand what God is doing. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you the path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. Honor the Lord with all your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then you will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine couple that with this verse proverbs or excuse me psalm chapter 84 verse 11 for the lord god is a sun and shield the lord will give grace and glory no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly in other words if i'm asking god to do something or wanting god to do something and he doesn't do it that indicates that it wasn't necessarily good for me God knows what he's doing and he has a plan and he has a purpose. And I can be enthusiastically trusting him in the face of circumstance and situations. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good of those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Let me encourage you, like David, to trust God. And then David not only trusted God, but he walked with God on a daily basis basis he walked with God can I just say this to you as you think about the whole the whole idea of walking with God means that we walk according to God's principles Psalm 23 how many are familiar with Psalm 23 Psalm 23 is written by an individual who clearly just didn't have the concept to chink I went to church today Psalm 23 is written by an individual who has an intimate, deep relationship with God. And listen to what it says. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Let me, he lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me befo- beside peaceful streams. 
He renews my strength. And that's what I'm praying for many of you today who are at this altar saying, God, I just want more of you that he would renew your strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely goodness an unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live or dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is a result of spiritual intimacy. David had a connection relationship built with God. And he trusted him. In fact, a verse that's up on the screen. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? It's the Message Bible because I love the way that it's rendered. The Message Bible says do two people Walk hand in hand if they aren't going to the same place. This tell you, God is not going to walk in sin. God is not going to walk in sin. And if I'm going to walk with God, I'm gonna, and I'm going to walk with God on a daily basis, it means that I'm going to walk in a way that honors him. In fact, listen to the way John pens it in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. He says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. We lie and do not practice the truth. Then there's the antithesis of that. He says, but if we walk in the light. He says, as he is in the light, what do we have? We have fellowship. So in other words, if an individual is not walking according to the scripture, they aren't going to be in fellowship with God. If they're not in fellowship with God, it's very difficult to have enthusiasm about what God is going to do. But if we have walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 8 and 9 says, But the Lord is, will command the blessing on you in your storehouses, in an all to which you set your hand, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Um, the Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. It's very difficult for me to have enthusiasm with God if I am being convicted by him. Can I, a lot of times people say, well, you know, I, I just really, you know, I, sometimes I, I go to church and I don't necessarily, you know, I, I mean, I, I, feel, I feel convicted. Well, that's actually a good thing, but it, conviction's not going to go away until you repent. <laughs> but if I repent and I walk in the light as he is in the light, I have fellowship one with the other, and then I'm able to be, be, and be filled with enthusiasm. God, I know that's what you're going to, and then David was a worshiper. Can I? Let's really quickly talk about this for a minute. So allow me some, um, some liberty with you this morning, if you would. Somebody said, I've already done that. Well, let me some more. Because I want to talk about this kind of subject today with you regarding the element of, as it relates to being a worshiper. The Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 16, it says, Now the ark of the Lord came into the city of David. Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. The Bible is telling us that David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was a warrior, and I know I've talked about this, I mentioned it last week because I was talking about the whole idea of duct tape truths talking to men, because sometimes men have this idea that to be a worshiper or to be involved in worship is some kind of an unmanly kind of concept. But David is an incredible warrior who gets so caught up in God that the Bible says he's jumping up and down and twirling before the Lord. In fact, the Bible tells us that he takes off his robe and puts on a linen ephod. David is a worshiper. He doesn't care what anybody else thinks. Can I just say to us as individuals, as an individual who is maybe dealing with the whole aspect of worship, let me encourage you to realize that in theos or in God is the whole idea of being touched and opened by, to the Holy Spirit. 
So well, if that means being open to the Holy Spirit means that I need to be an individual who acts crazy, then I'm not going to be involved. Can I suggest that's a very good possibility that you're not going to be involved? And I'm not saying that just to be crazy means that I'm somehow touched by the Spirit of God. But, at the same token, a lot of times he will, you know, well, no, no. I, I remember being in a church, we were on vacation, we were up in church, we were at a church and we were, I, I learned to sit in the back in most churches. I'm visiting, seriously, I'm, it's easy to escape. Serious, sometimes again, you just need to escape. But in a church and, you know, they're doing some stuff and, you know, you're like, you know, I've just come from a, kind of like a Pentecostal background. And so when something happens, I get excited. I'm like, yeah, and then, you know, and those people kind of like look at you. What in the world? And then, like, man, I, I wish we could clap. I heard him say that. I wish we could clap. Why can't you clap? Clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Recognizing that it's okay. I, as an individual, as I as it developed the whole idea of worship, God is in the midst of us. Spiritual enthusiasm comes from a relationship and connection with God. David is a worshiper. We're a worshiper because if God has covered us from with the blood of Jesus Christ, and we are free from sin. God's grace is in your life. I don't have to be perfect to earn it. That in itself is something that I go, thank God. You're a worshiper because, you know, you, you, I can't hold myself up any longer. I just can't do it. Can't hold myself up on my, by my bootstraps or lift my, I need to be a worshiper so God's spirit can come and penetrate my life and empower me. I'm a worshiper because I walk with God and I trust him to be able to touch and transform my life. Can I just say to you, if being a worshiper does not describe your life, let me encourage you to give it a try. The Bible says this, Psalm 63, verse 4, and I'm almost done. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. Has anybody here ever been a presenter? Has anybody here ever had to give a, how many have, have you in school had to give a speech? Most of you in school probably had to give a speech. Now, I, I, I don't, you know, when you were giving your speech, did you ever have somebody, you know, like, have their head on the table? You know what I'm talking about? They had their head on the table, or, you know, you're, and then, this is what happened. They had their head on the table, like, you got done, said, man, I was listening to every word you said. How many, you didn't, uh-huh. Just saying, I recognize that sometimes the element of posture doesn't always denote the element of spirit, but frequently. In fact, I preached a message one time, you can't tell a book by its cover, but you can tell a lot about its contents. Recognize that it isn't always depictive and definitive, but can I just say to you that, I, that when then I make an element of pot, lifting up my hands, and God, I want to give you praise and thank you because you're the King of kings and the Lord of Psalm chapter 141 verse 2 says, let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. If you want to have enthusiasm, you're going to need to be able and be willing to worship God and say, God, I, I want you to fill me with your spirit. Because I had a conversation just recently with somebody about the, the spirit of God and, and the, even the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I talked about the whole idea of yielding to the spirit. Recognizing that if I want the spirit, how many know that God never intended that he would be our servants? God always intended that we would be his servants. And all throughout the scripture, whether we're talking about Genesis, whether we're talking about the book of Revelation, God is outlining a lifestyle, a purpose that says, if you'll do these things. In fact, we just read about a few of them. If you do these things, then you'll have my blessing in your life. If you want 
the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, you want to be enthusiastic, you're going to need to learn to trust God in the face of every given circumstances. Walk with him on a daily basis. That means I'm walking in a way that pleases God. I'm following his word. There's times that people go, you know, I don't want to live any way I want. I can do whatever I want. God will bless me. Eh, wrong answer. If you want God's blessing in your life, then you're going to need to walk with God on a daily basis. And then develop the whole idea of becoming a worshiper. We had, a, had an amazing opportunity this morning. And it's my prayer that you took an, the, the, that opportunity and said, okay, God, fill me up. Change and transform my life. I am here to lift up the name of Jesus and magnify the king and to glorify him. I want him to fill me up so I can be enthusiastic. So my enthusiasm impacts the place that I work, my home life. Every aspect of who I am. Let's pray. God, thank you that we could be here today.